we invite you to view our videos on YouTube, available to you anytime, day or night from anywhere in the world. Click the subscribe button and smash that bell icon to be notified when we upload new content. Just follow the link on your screen, youtube.com forward slash Broad Street Presbyterian Church. Welcome to worship with the community of the Broad Street Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're worshiping with us today on this third Sunday after Epiphany. Our scripture reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, the story of Jesus calling the first disciples. Pastor Amy Miracle is preaching. Her sermon is called, It's All About the Boat. In the midst of all that's going on in Columbus, in our country, in our world, in ourselves, we pause for prayer. Join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, hear our prayer for the mending of our hearts torn apart by our unkindness, for the healing of our souls wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek for the sin we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our actions, and the hope that your grace awaits us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. In the midst of life, the love of God is so deep and so wide. The love of God is so patient and so kind. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Today, as we extend peace to one another, I invite you to extend that reach beyond your own home. Email someone, text someone, call someone, listen, check in, share peace. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. God of every journey, walk with us this day and every day. Open us to your presence in the Bible and in all your world so that we may be strengthened to follow you. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Time. We're going to retell the Bible story using the Brick Testament, a Lego version of the Bible, because it's such a good story. I want us to hear and see it one more time. As he was walking by the Lake of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were making a net to cast into the lake, for they were fishermen. He said to them, come after me and I will make you fishers of people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John 
and they were in their boat with their father Zebedee mending their nets. He called to them. And at once, leaving the boat and their father, they followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The very first thing Jesus does in his public ministry is invite others to be a part of the work. Before he shares good news, before he heals anyone of disease, he builds a team. He does some recruiting. He identifies a crew to fill a 12-person boat. Now let me explain. I just finished a novel in which the central character is a rower. So I've been thinking a lot about rowing and I've been thinking a lot about Jesus and what the two might have in common. And that led me to revisit a favorite book of mine. It's called The Boys in the Boat. Uh, written in 2014, uh, it is built around the story of eight rowers and one coxswain who come from working class families and who during the Great Depression win a gold medal at the 1936 Olympics in Germany. Author Daniel James Brown uh, comes at this story uh, of the University of Washington rowing team from a lot of different angles, but all focus on the question of how do the many become one? Well, he focuses on one particular rower named Joe Rance. Now, Joe's mother dies when he is six years old. And in the years afterwards, he has shoveled back and forth between relatives and his father. Well, one afternoon in 1929, when then 15-year-old Joe comes home from school, uh, he finds that the family car is packed, his stepmother is in the front seat, and the younger kids are in the back. Where are we going? He asks his father. I'm not sure. But the thing is, the, the little kids are going to need a father more than you are. You're pretty much all grown up. But can't I just come along? Joe asks. No, that won't work. Look, son, if there's one thing I figured out about life, it's that if you want to be happy, you have to learn how to be happy on your own. And with that, Joe's father walks to the car, gets in, drives away, leaving 15-year-old Joe on his own. And he somehow figures it out. He fends for himself. He survives. He graduates from high school. He gets into the University of Washington, and he becomes a part of their rowing team. He makes a vow to himself never again to let himself depend on anyone else, never to fully trust anyone or anything. He would make it on his own. But the problem for Joe is that eight-man rowing is the ultimate team sport. You can have the eight strongest rowers in the world, but if they don't row together, they're nothing. The challenge is to pull each stroke with the greatest possible power, stroke at the greatest possible rate, and do so in perfect eight-part harmony, stroke after stroke after stroke, all under the coxswain's direction. And rowing, you have to pull together and you need to have each other's back. The many have to become one. And that proves to be the challenge for this University of Washington rowing team. Um, at times, they are in perfect sync and appear to be unbeatable. And at other times, the whole thing falls apart. Maybe you've had that experience. The disciples certainly are familiar with this. This group of 12 that Jesus gathers, they are kind of a mess. Um, slow to understand. They bicker among themselves. They jockey for position. They're distrustful of one another, not rowing in the same direction. Well, I'm betting you've probably had that experience. When the team or group we are a part of at school, at work, our home is not rowing in the same direction. We don't have each other's back. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. The many do not become one. Um, time, energy, goodwill are wasted. It is frustrating and it's tiring. But it happens fairly often because it's a tricky thing, a very tricky thing for the many to become one. Well, the Washington rowing program has a secret weapon. Um, a man named George Yeoman Pocock 
an Englishman, a, a, a great rower, a boat builder, and, and something of a, of a philosopher. Um, and one day, as he and Joe are having a talk, Pocock tells him, Joe, when you really start trusting those other boys, you will feel a power at work within you that is far beyond anything you've ever imagined. Sometimes you will feel as if you rode right off the planet and are rowing among the stars. Years later, Pocock would make a similar comment to his biographer. Rowing is a symphony of motion. And when you're rowing well, why it's nearing perfection and you're touching the divine. It touches the you of yous, which is your soul, end quote. When a team of people work together in a common direction, in a common purpose, all of them rowing in the same direction, there is nothing quite like it. It can happen on a sports team. It can happen in a choir or orchestra or band. It can happen on a building site, in a commercial kitchen, um, an operating room. It, it can happen in an organization. It can happen in a church. Well, back to our story about the first days of Jesus' ministry. Now, we're familiar with a few of, of the names of that initial group, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, but most of the names, eh, we don't know all that well. Um, it, it, and maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. Because it's really not about them. It's about God. It's about telling people about God and inviting them into a new way of living. It isn't about them. It's about the boat. Joe Rance died in 2007 at the age of 93. Before he died, Brown had the opportunity to interview him multiple times. This is how he describes the end of that first meeting with Joe. I shook Joe's hand again and told him I would like to come back and talk to him some more, and that I would like to write a book about his rowing days. Joe grasped my hand and said he'd like that, but then his voice broke and he admonished me gently, but not just about me, it has to be about the boat. It has to be about the boat. This all works when it's all about the boat. But part of what enables a group of rowers to do that is a good coxswain. That's the member of the team who does not row and is actually facing the direction that the boat is going. The coxswain is responsible for steering the boat and, and coordinating the power and rhythm of the rowers. Unlike the coach, they are actually in the boat with the other rowers, literally in the same boat. Um, he or she needs to know where they are going and how to get there. And the rest of the boat needs to trust in that person's leadership, trust their in instincts, trust their voice. One rowing coach said, one of a coxswain's most respected skills is the ability to reach in and pull something out of a rower they didn't know they had. Now for us here in, here in the church, who is our coxswain? Well, let me tell you, it's not me, it's not Anne, it's not even the session, the governing board of the church. No, our, our coxswain is, is God. I, I feel really strongly about that. Um, that this whole enterprise, it's not, it's not about us. It's, it's all about God. Um, it's all about the boat. You know, that's what the disciples learn. Um, they learn that slowly, painfully, from experience, from failure. Uh, it's one step forward, two steps back kind of learning but they do. Um, but they don't, they don't really start rowing in the same direction until much later in the story, after, after Jesus dies, after he's raised from the dead. Um, then, wow, the disciples figure a whole bunch of things out. They become, they become a team. And, and what they're able to accomplish is, is remarkable. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we are 
here today, the church exists because of their ability to learn to work together and to row in the same direction. Um, and I think it, 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 that's primarily because they, they discover, they, they rediscover, they, it's not about them. It's about the deep rumblings of the spirit. It's about a, a, an intrusive, persistent God who will not let us go. It's about a world filled with people who, who hunger, who hunger for more meaning, um, for more justice, for more forgiveness, for more community, for more grace, for more God. It's about them. It's, it's about God. Yeah, that moment, it happens for the disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection. The disciples become a team, a crew. They become amazing leaders. They become a part of something bigger than themselves. Is there any joy greater than becoming a part of something bigger than ourselves? That happens when, when we trust God and when we trust one another. But it's so darn counterintuitive. We become most fully ourselves when we most rely on others. Back to Joe and his teammates. They qualify to represent the United States in the 1936 Olympics held in Berlin. Um, they row the race of their lives and they somehow manage to defeat the favored home team. This is how the book describes the experience of that race for Joe. Quote, in the last desperate few hundred meters of the race, in the searing pain and bewildering noise of that furious final sprint, there had come a singular moment when Joe realized with startling clarity that there was nothing more he could do to win the race, except for one thing. He could finally abandon all doubt, trust absolutely without reservation that he and the boy in front of him and the boys behind him would all do precisely what they needed to do at precisely the instant they needed to do it. He had known in that instant that there could be no hesitation, no shred of indecision. He had no choice but to throw himself into each stroke as if he were throwing himself off a cliff into a void with unquestioned faith that the others would be there to save him. And he had done it. Over and over, 44 times per minute, he had hurled himself blindly into his future, not just believing, but knowing that the other boys would be there for him, all of them, moment by precious moment. End quote. When it's all about the boat, the many become one. And when the many become one, we can do amazing things. Amen.
Every week, worship reminds us that following Christ takes more faith and hope and love than any of us can muster on our own. Every week, worship reminds us that we are disciples of Jesus and that we're in the boat together and that this thing, church, is bigger than any one of us and that life, reality itself, is all about God. So I invite you to go out into the world with that identity. Go out into the world in peace to love and serve. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.